five. So if you haven't listened to part one yet, um, we talk about D.B. Cooper, so you should go back and listen to that. We split this up into two parts because there's huge stories in this episode. Um, and so part two is covering Boys on the Tracks and sports. Enjoy. Are we recording? Because I have to ask. Yeah, girl. It's my thing. <coughs> So this is the story of the boys on the tracks. And as I said at the beginning of the episode, please bear with me. Uh, It's a lot of information to sort out that comes out at different times and it's hard to put it all back together. So second segment of episode five is the unexplained death of the boys on the tracks. Pre-dawn, August 23rd, 1987. Uh, We have 16-year-old Don Henry and 17-year-old Kevin Ives. They're best friends. They're just, you know, regular teenage boys that like to do teenage boy things. They often, you know, go on double dates, go out to hang out with friends, blah, blah, blah. Uh, The night that this happens, the two met up with a bunch of friends at a local gathering place. Then they left around midnight to go back to Don's house. Don went inside to talk to his dad around 12.15, like, doing a little check-in, like, this is what we're going to be doing, which is really nice. Yeah. Um, Don takes his 22 with him um, because the boys are going to be doing this form of hunting called spotlighting, which is when they shine a light in the deer's eyes and then the other person shoots it. No. I know. It's so sad, Boo. but obviously it probably works. Um, so they go out to do this, and they're going into, like, the forest near their houses that they know. They are doing this sort of near the railroad tracks. Around yeah. four in the morning, there's a 6,000 ton cargo train heading toward Little Rock, Arkansas at 52 miles an hour. Um, the engineer aboard is Stephen Schroyer, and he's the one giving this interview on Unsolved Mysteries. It's and so sad. It's heartbreaking. Um, he you can tell. Up. Yeah. You oh. can tell he's like oh, traumatized yeah. by this. Can you imagine? No. The they're approaching this town of Bryant, Arkansas, but also sometimes it's Alexander. I'm not sure. I think most of this goes down in Alexander. Um, suddenly he notices that there's something on the tracks, and at first they can't tell what it is, but the closer they get, he can see that it's two boys lying motionless. Um, they're laid out parallel on the tracks, mm-hmm. like where their heads are on one end of a like a rail and their feet are on the other end of the rail they're laying next to each other and they're under a light green tarp he puts on the emergency brake and lays on the diesel horn but he knows it's not enough time um and again steven is just traumatized while talking about this he said he estimated three to five seconds till impact and his quote was that might not sound like a pretty long time but when you're bearing down on a couple of children it's an eternity honestly horrible horrible like, i'm sure time just stood still yeah. and he Ugh. i what can you do and just literally expected what can them you do to move expected something to happen mm-hmm. it's like when you're in a car accident and you watch the whole thing happen in slow motion yes. like while you're in it yes like That's nothing you can and no way to like not be a part of it you Ugh. know what i mean it's terrible so traumatizing so um the train obviously runs over the boys goes for a full half mile beyond that mm. uh the Jeez. bodies are obviously destroyed Steven says that it looked like a body morgue, the way the bodies were laid out, um, lying exactly parallel on the tracks, meaning it didn't look like like a candid situation. Yeah. You know what I mean? It didn't look like two people fell asleep on the road tracks next to each other. Right. Um, he says their arms are like straight down by their sides. They're partially covered by the, the light green tarp. Um, and he recalls that there was zero reaction to the loud diesel horn, not even a flinch, which is pretty crazy i mean it's let me see if i can find sorry my stuff is a little out of order that's okay Um, i read somewhere that no matter what even if you're trying to kill yourself your body will oh yeah your body will roll and try to protect itself regardless of what your intentions are while you're laying like your back would turn to the train exactly yes yeah it's like at the very least you'd flinch or cover your face it's an involuntary reaction basically um Oh, I was trying to find a part. There's something about like the number of decibels De- that that yeah, would be. Um, that. Yeah, like, like a jack ringing of the. Yes. 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 God, I have it somewhere. Sorry. Yeah. No, I think it's 98 decibels. I think it's a it's a jackhammer. Okay. Like impossible to like yeah. sleep through. You'll get into it, but yeah. just whatever they were do, you know, all the theories. It's like, yeah, you'd wake up if you were asleep, if you were exactly. stoned, if you were whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. um 
uh, the state medical examiner says the boys are under the influence of marijuana. Um, he says they smoke the equivalent of 20 marijuana cigarettes, which I'm sorry, but nobody does that. No. Also, they were only out for a few hours. They would have had to have three joints, three to five joints going at the same time between the two of them, rapidly smoking in order to consume those 20 marijuana joints yes. in the time that they were out. It's just, it's physically impossible. It makes impossible. no sense. And no one would do it. No one would do that. No. It, there's no point. It's That's not even fun. No. Uh -huh. And... There's no reason. I mean, and two teenagers in that's Arkansas so can't afford that anyway. Like, exactly. That's, that's, it, none of it makes yeah. sense. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Like, they wouldn't even have that much on them at one time. No. Yeah. So the medical examiner says they were in such a deep sleep induced by the drug. Um, so stupid. And Mommy. Linda Ives, the mother of Kevin, said her immediate reaction is that they, if they were that stoned, how did they end up laying in identical positions, which is a really good point. Um. So, and Larry, Larry Ives, the father of Kevin, says he doesn't believe Kevin was on marijuana or any other hard drugs because he was, like, he lived with him. He could tell he was not that type of kid. He also oh said, like, he wasn't, like, a latchkey kid. Like, there was always somebody at the house. Yeah. One of them went to go check in with his dad at midnight. You know, like, they're, yeah. they're good kids. They're not. Oh, then it was the other. One of the parents was like, I'm home during the day. My wife is home at night. We would know if our kid was stoned or yeah. whatever Even if they are occasionally stoned they're not that and the stoned. parents don't know they're not that stoned if you yeah. want to get so high that you smoke 20 joints you're just going to move to a harder drug yeah because it'll totally. take less time yeah like and these poor parents that are on the show i know it's yeah. horrible okay so here's my thing yes it's 98 decibels would have been equivalent to a jackhammer and an air compressor running at the same time so uh the medical examiner rules it an accident uh, Ives also says that he knows his son wouldn't just lay his, oh, so his gun was found off to the side as long, as well oh, as their yeah. flashlight. I've said he knows his son wouldn't just lay his like precious gun down on gravel. So that part doesn't make sense. The parents hold a pref press conference and hope to for, hope to force authorities to reopen the investigation. And I think this is all like real on, on self mysteries. It's not a reenactment. Like, yeah. They're actually filming them like planning and preparing for this press conference. It's just sad that like they had to do that. They no, had to like I can't imagine how maddening. They had to go to the media be. because no one was helping them. Um and no one would be like no, it's not an accident. Yeah. So um this works and the day after the press conference the case is reopened. So prosecutor Richard Garrett calls for a new autopsy. The new report says that they had 2 to 3 joints, not 20, which makes way more sense. He also says that one boy was already dead and one was unconscious when the train hit them. Um, in July of 88, a grand jury reversed the medical examiner's original finding and rules the deaths probable homicides. So the green tarp, uh, they didn't own it. Why would somebody cover them with it? What? So if you try, were trying to kill yourself, were you going to, like, are you going to sleep? Are you going to pull that green tarp up like over you? Blanket? Like it's a bed sheet? No. Like, right. It's it just also, doesn't make so sense. even the laying down, like the position of the gun and the flashlight, they were like parallel to the boys. They were placed. It wasn't as if, right? You know, it, it, yeah. And like Stephen, the engineer, is telling this story of the tarp, and he's like, "I saw it. Four other people saw it. We know we saw it, um, but no one will like believe that the tarp was real and the tarp was never found. They didn't either. put it in the police report." Mm -mm. So the tarp was not found? No. no they could not find it. What? Because the investigating officers said, there's no tarp. Yep. But, but someone might have just taken it. Yeah, I think. If five people see a thing and then it disappears, it probably existed. Yeah. I would venture to think. Wow. So one week before the boys were killed, a man wearing army fatigues was spotted in the area acting suspiciously. When a police officer named Danny Allen stopped to speak to him, he opened fire but they could never catch this guy. Also, my notes, I'm like, what? I how know. do we not know anything? Else? Like, you again, how can you just shoot at a police officer? Yeah, I know. Well, and th this guy, I mean, this is all from Unsolved Mysteries, and this guy does not come up again in any of my mm -hmm. research. So nothing, so if it's real, had shaking. nothing to do with anything. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I guess a few witnesses reported seeing this man down the road less than tw 200 yards from where the boys were on the tracks, but police could never find him. Um, Richard Garrett finds a similar case in Hodgden, o Oklahoma. 
200 miles from Little Rock, uh, where two boys are found laying on the tracks that have been run over by a locomotive in 1984. They were positioned in the same way that Kevin and Don were. So I'm wondering, because it's very clear that these two boys did not kill themselves, so that this was staged. And I'm wondering if the crimes were associated or if someone in the know did that did that to two to, other boys yeah to loosely affiliate like mm. maybe they were like oh why don't we do what the, what this like a copycat yeah situation. sort of but also to be like and then people will think it's connected yeah mm-hmm. and people will think it's just a mad person on the loose doing this to two boys at a time yeah yeah although that was three years apart so that's really like yeah i don't know so richard garrett the prosecutor thinks um that someone had hurt one boy and then had to hurt the other put them on the tracks. Um, Richard Garrett also says that since he's been working on this case, he has started carrying a gun because mm-hmm. he's yeah in his life. So another sad thing about this whole situation is that um, the family ends up going and investigating the scene themselves. No. Like multiple times. They show the dad like walking the tracks over yep. and over Mr. and over Mr. Ives, again. it oh, says he yeah. went out hundreds so of times sad. observing like the scenario, the area. How like, loud the train would be. Yep. Does analyzing, he think he could be still? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Analyzing every single aspect of it. Um, he thinks that the boys were in the wrong place at the wrong time and walked up on something they weren't supposed to see and he says he knows it was a murder. After Unsolved Mysteries covered this, um, There's sort of an update, but not like an official like Unsolved Mysteries update, but Robert Stack basically in the closing of the episode. It's one of the few times that Stack comes back on the air. Usually it's just a typewritten update. Exactly. That's what I found really interesting. The only other time we've seen it is uh, Gail Delano. Oh, really? Uh, In episode. You know what? Maybe it's when the update is more tragic or more like emotionally triggering than other other oh, updates I was that they're thinking, like, let's bring Robert with, Stack with back Gail on to Delano. sort of deliver the news. Yeah, because with Gail Delano, he's doing that. Because imagine oh, if you were watching it and you just saw update, Gail Delano committed suicide. Like, right. that could be Died very upsetting. That's true. Yeah. But he's not like wearing a different outfit. He's in the same scene he was as, the, as ending the other, like wrapping up the other segments. So... I don't know if maybe some information came out during while they were like putting this episode together. I don't know. I was curious about that. Yeah. Um, So post recording the episode, Don Henry's shirt is analyzed and tears in the fabric indicate he was stabbed before the train ran him over. Um, With this new evidence, the grand jury changes the ruling from probable homicide to definite homicide. And that's where the unsolved mysteries episode ends. And that's where it all begins. I would like us to start looking up when each episode or segment actually airs okay we can do that because you can find that and sometimes i think that's kind of important to know because it's possible that this aired really soon after it happened so what year this what year did this happen 87 okay so yeah it was probably 88 or 89 so it was only two years after so that's probably the only update that they had because i mean stuff is still coming out about this story yes so yeah. You know, you can't fault them for only knowing 18 months or 24 months worth of information. Yeah. All right, girl. Dig in. Yes. All right. So now we have the updates since this episode aired, which was a long ass time ago and a lot of stuff has happened. Um, the case was the subject of journalist Mara Leverett's award winning book, Boys on the Tracks Death Denial and the Mother's Crusade to Bring Her Son's Killers to Justice. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was released in 1999, and it's said to be one of the most important examples of investigative journalism in modern Arkansas history. Wow. Well, in modern Arkansas. Yeah, I know. Right. I thought that was funny. The book won the Booker Worthen Literary Prize in 2000. Wow. So, oh, it won the Booker Prize? Mm-hmm. All right. Okay, that sounds good then. <laughs> so, Dr. Fami, is it, is it Fami? Fami. Fami. Dr. Fami Malik mm. was the medical examiner that said the boys had fallen asleep on the tracks Boo. due to smoking 20 marijuana cigarettes. What's crazy about this is that the authorities were not questioning any of this. Yeah. They didn't think this was weird at all. And the parents of the boys had to be the ones that were like, no, that cannot have happened. Which, can you imagine being in that? I mean, we've talked about this a little bit, but like your child dies, you assume, you hope that someone else is taking care of this for you. Someone else will figure it out. Mm-hmm. Oh, they're not. They're in fact saying something that cannot be true. 
So you have to be the one who steps up and says, no. Right. And like heinously not true. Like Uh, obviously not true to the point where they're like, are you fucking kidding me? So I don't know if you're going to get into Malik's history. Yes. Okay. Um, Because I want to talk to you about it. Is it not so good? Well, I just, uh, I want to talk to you about it, even if we cut it. Okay. (laughs) Okay, so the parents move move forward with conducting their own investigations and like hiring their own people because they're just like fuck this shit. We're gonna do this on our own. Mm-hmm. Um, in Leverett's book, she says that Malik's own staff accused him of keeping outdated crime lab stationery, and said he allegedly falsified findings in autopsy reports just before certain cases went to court. Cool. So stay tuned because I will say more on that. <laughs> um, I know. It's crazy. I'm so excited. Excited in a sad way. I mean, yeah, but super important. Well, Allison is doing a happy dance. Oh, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> another weird thing was that the hospital where the boys were taken and examined kept no records of their presence there. Okay. That's how hospitals work. They don't what keep the any fuck? records. None. No, that's definitely illegal, right? No, <laughs> not in Arkansas. Oh what happens God. in an Arkansas hospital? <laughs> Stay, it's like Las Vegas. Yeah, it stays in an Arkansas hospital. <laughs> Um, Levitt also wrote that a hospital clerk told an investigator that's why the families were not billed. Oh, well. Ew. Okay. Great. They're like, don't worry. They didn't have to pay the copay. So they shouldn't want to find out what happened yeah. to their Yeah, so child. like keep your mouth shut you, or you know, you're going to... Oh, He got off for free, so... Yeah. Oh my gosh. Um, a medical report from one of the EMTs at the tracks that night noted that the boy's blood looked like it lacked oxygen. Oh, that's right. So... Yeah. It was, like, clearly not fresh blood. It was, like, kind of congealed and dark and, you know. We know what fresh blood looks like. Any any person does. You don't have to be, like, an examiner or an investigator. Um, So, obviously, that points towards the fact that the boys were already dead when the train hit them. Mm -hmm. Um, In 1988, the parents of the boys have Dr. James Garriott give a second opinion on the autopsies. Garriott and another toxicologist both are basically, like, Malik's report is completely bogus. Um, they both state that no amount of THC, THC would ever knock you out to the point of not waking up when a six ton tra- six thousand ton train was rushing towards you, blaring its horn. I like. I honestly don't. I can't think of a drug. Yeah, that's what I was just gonna say. I don't think that heroin could do that. It can't unless no. you were literally unless you were already unconscious, totally unconscious from an overdose, right? Which would have showed up in any report. But I mean, even it's, still, yeah, I mean, I guess so. But, but I feel like the even likelihood, some levels of unconsciousness no. could have been brought back from. I'm, mm-hmm. Yeah, but like you would have to be overdosing to the point of unconsciousness. You would have to be doing it simultaneously with the person that you're with. Yeah. And you would have both happened to have to lay with your arms out, like arms at your side in a perfect position I mean, yep. even the most what the fuck of drugs right. isn't going to do that. No. no. But then, especially not marijuana. Especially not. I don't care if you smoke a billion joints. No, no. That's stupid. No one does. Cut no that. one even. Uh, <laughs> like, nobody can smoke a billion joints. No one can and smoke 20. No one does that. No. 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 So, and one of the doctors even said that the only true test to be able to tell if there were drugs in the boy's system wasn't even performed during the autopsy. Okay, good. So Malik is doing a great job and very thorough. He's a hero. He's a hero. I don't know why in my mind it's a she. I keep wanting it to be a she. So that's your own, that's your own gender self-loathing. I guess so. Interesting. So if you can't sense our snark, just stop listening. Yeah, really. We're obviously saying the opposite of how we feel yeah (laughs) okay things are gonna keep getting weirder james h steed the sheriff in saline county at that time kept telling the local newspaper that there was nothing at the tracks that could lead them to believe this was anything but an accident kevin's mother linda then wrote a letter to the same newspaper criticizing everything he was saying (laughs) um the prosecutor in this case Dan Harmon. Yeah, Dan oh, Harmon. Which we're going to call it? out as being confusing because, yes, obviously there's a very famous Dan Harmon as well, and it's he's not a, him. He's the best. It's not Rick and Morty Dan Harmon. It's 80s lawyer Dan Harmon. Which is good because Rick and Morty Dan Harmon is amazing and a national treasure, and that other Dan Harmon is garbage. Garbage person. Um, 
Harmon sets up an agreement with the sheriff's office that if the parents will take back their criticism and say they support the sheriff's oh office, my gosh. then the sheriff's office will actually open a real fucking I investigation. I cry. Are Can you kidding? you imagine? Like, it isn't even like if you... Sh- it's not a payoff. It's not like if you shut your mouth, we'll give you $100,000. No. It's if you it's be quiet... It's something that you deserve in the first place. Yeah. It's like It's like being like, if you'll be quiet, we'll put your utilities back on. I yeah. want to cry. That it's is horrible. Horrible. Like, what are you gonna do? That's Hire terrible. a private investigator. That's what you're gonna fucking do. So six months after the boys died, there's a three day hearing. Um, after waiting for days to hear back on this in February of 1988, the ruling is finally changed from accidental to undetermined, which obviously is not what the parents wanted. No, it's a homicide, obviously. And this is just the start of like. A really long fight for the fucking Iveses and Henrys. Like, it's crazy. So, the second autopsy is performed by um, medical examiner Dr. Joseph Burton. And in April of 88, the case is put before a grand jury. Somewhere around June of 88, the grand jury rules the deaths as a probable, probable homicide, which I said. So, then we have, this is where Unsolved Mysteries airs their episode in the fall of 88. Uh, when asked about his thoughts on the case by host Robert Stack, Garrett alleged that the boys saw something they shouldn't have and it had to do with drugs. But it, that's what this article said that I read. But in the episode that we watched, no. they didn't say drugs Nothing. at all. So no. I don't know if something was changed in the re-release Weird. to take that out. And I don't know why it would have been. I don't think it would have been changed in the re-release. Although, oh, it might have been cut for time. If that's what I was wondering. Like, did they? Because the, bo- the but that seems like a key I know, but thing the, to cut. I don't know. Um, the grand jury announces that the, the deaths may have been affiliated with drug trafficking. Sheriff Steed does not allow any funds to go towards the investigation because he's the worst sheriff there's ever been. I am so mad. I have mm, I the know. lack. Oh, the lack of checks and balances in these like. Because it just goes district by district. Sometimes <sighs> you vote a sheriff in. Oh, yeah. Sometimes it's you're still a placed problem. In. It's still a it's huge still problem. It's still a problem. It was yeah. a huge thing with the West Memphis 30. Yeah. And it's literally not even state by state, I don't think. I think it's like jurisdiction by jurisdiction. If you're a sheriff, you shouldn't be also a politician. No. You should just be a sheriff. Yeah. You should be good at your job. You should solve crimes. And that's that. You shouldn't have to run to re-election every two to four years or whatever the the scenario is like it's insanity and it's the same bullshit that happens every time in these small towns Mm -hmm. it's the sheriff has to be elected same with the judges too they're elected yes listen to season three of serial so good it's all about i haven't listened to it yet sorry i'm cutting into your case no No. it's it's, fine uh, she just spends a year in a courtroom in ohio listening to case after case after case of basically injustice and how our our system is so crazy. Yeah, there's it's a so good. there's a documentary on Netflix about um, a teacher in Pennsylvania, uh, judge in Pennsylvania, who, no matter what the child did, he was a juvenile. Sh- he or she was a juvenile court judge. No matter what the child did, they would be sentenced to juvenile hall. Till you found out, the judge was a partial owner because it was a privatized prison. Oh my God. And then he had That's the audacity. It, it was a guy. Black for all, yes. All time. It was a guy, and he had the audacity Gross. when all of this came out to say, obviously, that's not going to influence my decision. Oh, a multi million dollar prison facility. One girl, like, threw a piece of paper across the room in her oh. classroom, got sent to the principal, and ended up in juvenile detention. And they interviewed, like, three or four different girls. Their lives are completely ruined oh, by this fuck. person. You, yeah. Oh, yeah, I believe it. Yeah. It's- that sounds sorry right. sociopaths yeah it's just such a slippery like we could it's, talk about this forever like the justice yes. system is as it's one of the best in the world sadly, sadly. but it's still deeply it's, deeply flawed yeah because it's run by humans exactly new, yeah, yeah that's love perfect the new season of serial it's so horrifying but also good <laughs> yeah all right sorry well, baby kind of our jam um so steed worst sheriff ever also fucks up the investigation of the boy's clothing because he was supposed to send it to the FBI and he doesn't. He just sends it to the state crime lab. Um, 
One good thing that comes of this is that the public gets wise to what a douchebag Steed is, and they don't reelect him. Oh, so, good. Um, okay, so now the story gets real bad. Oh, now it does. Now. Cool. I was feeling super good until now, so lay it on me. Okay, and this is probably where my timelines are going to get a little fucked up and it's like fine. go bop back and forth. Um, two days after stupid Steed loses the election... An informant for Harmon, Keith McCaskill, is asked to take an aerial shot of the crime scene. Before he can do this, he's murdered. And he had told his friends that he might be killed for something that he knew. Yep. A 26-year-old man, Greg Collins, is called to testify before the grand jury in January 1989. Before he can do this, he's shot three times in the face and killed. Okay. Oh, I hate those type of accidents. I hate them. It's like you never know. You never know. You might get shot three times in the face. Never know. Um, only a few weeks before this, Collins's friend Keith Coney had been called to testify as well and shortly dies in a motorcycle accident after an alleged high-speed chase. Oh, my god! An alleged high-speed chase. In March 1989, Daniel Booney Bearden is called to court but disappears. One last death that might be related to this case. I'm sorry. I just want to describe <laughs> Eliza's face right now. So I know a lot about this case because this is my jam. Yeah. Eliza doesn't know a lot about this case I'm getting because chills. this is not her jam. KB is somewhere in the middle. Um, Eliza put, she gasped so heavily that she knew she was going to breathe deep into the microphone, and I hate <laughs> she that. She leaned away. <laughs> um, so she leaned away with her whole fist over her mouth. <laughs> she and literally aghast. <laughs> literally said, Oh, God. <laughs> As she rocked backwards. Like, yeah, I no. I did not know any of those four yeah things. and this is the part that i'm sorry that i can't spend more time on because there's you more crazy what? details in here but i'm just giving it's you fine. a can, real snapshot of or we can the always upness. do if people want to know more about this there are obviously a lot of other ways to find out about it but yeah. we can always do a mini sode about these just these four people that's crazy like that alone and that alone deserves like a little bit of investigation right without it? like yeah like because they must have looked into who killed them yeah who obviously. killed them and who was involved in that high-speed chase yeah oh god I keep going Sorry. wait but so, but so far my thoughts are it is not only someone trying to off these people so they can't do more work to solve the case but it's someone must have known these specific names like it's also someone inside the yeah the police, system the system yes yeah the hospital's also involved, apparently. Like, yeah, it's yeah. insane. It's problematic. Um, and yeah, okay. So another death that might be related to this case is that of Edward Rhodes, which I also found his name Jeff Rhodes sometimes, um, whose body was found in a landfill in April of eighty nine. Jordan Kettleson may have had information on the deaths and was shot dead in the front seat of his truck. James, are what? these people? Do they all live in the same town or county? I believe they're all from the area. Shit, Arkansas. I mean, What's your what? murder rate like? Yeah. It took a uh, spike in 88 and 89. Fuck. <laughs> this one. James Millam was another possible source for information and was found decapitated. But Malik ruled his death to be due to natural causes. I hate when that happens. When your head just falls off. I hate when you're like in the middle of having a heart attack and your head falls off. Okay. Fami. So, fucking Fami. So I want to say really quick as an aside, the captain from True Crime Garage hates Fami Malik so much he made a t-shirt about it, yes. which I think oh. is the truest, best I way I I want want to it. get revenge on someone's name is by actually making a t-shirt that like talks about how much you don't like them. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. He, yes. We, um, we can just have a whole hate closet. Yeah. Right? No. Oh, yeah. So many t-shirts. <laughs> we hate a lot of people. It's too easy to fill up. <laughs> I need a like, walk in. Like outside of the murders and shit. Definitely we just kinda... a walk in. I don't even have in my, for the clothes I like or the people I like. Oh my God. Oh my God. Okay. Go ahead. Oh. So the deaths were ruled homicides in March of 90, but no arrests were made. Sadly, because the cops were not really doing much about the investigation, like I mentioned, relatives were taking matters in their own hands and doing things themselves. Which should not be their job. Yeah. One of the relatives found one of the boy's feet and some gold chains that the police didn't find at the fucking crime scene. Uh, Malik's autopsy report has no mention of a missing foot. So he... Okay. He's like... <laughs> 
about like were his eyes open do you think he did it just he's like this was an accident and uh i mean it's not weird that the foot is missing it's weird that he didn't report anything about it saying miss a foot is yeah also the investigators of the scene didn't do a great job oh my god they left a foot behind this small town shit man holy (gasps) oh my god i'm so mad weren't you mad i'm so mad (laughs) we need our (laughs) t-shirts dr malik's rulings on mysterious deaths have come under close scrutiny many times in may of 1992 the la times did a cover story on him and how shady he is the times cited over 20 other cases that were uh, grossly bungled is what it said there was also a 2020 tv special that covered the story which i would love to see so and then this is another part that i'm so sorry i'm not getting more into but It's all jumbled together, and it's hard to find information on some of it. There was a witness testimony from someone uh, who was a child at the time. I think his name was Tommy, but I couldn't really find much about it. I'm mostly piecing this together from what I heard on other pods. But he uh, saw someone at the scene that he recognized. And he recognized this person because they were dating his mother. And that person was Dan Harmon. Oh, that's right. No, this is a well-known thing. So not only did this 12-year-old boy, not to Go, jump in. you're good. Yeah, I just, I from what I remember about this, um, not only did the 12-year-old boy see Dan Harmon with these two boys, but there are at least three to five different eyewitness accounts mm-hmm. of two, quote-unquote, undercover police officers fighting with these two boys. Yeah, and those are some of the people I mentioned that were killed. Yeah. These are the people that saw stuff happen that night. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there were multiple witnesses that saw two undercover police officers beating up two teenage boys and throwing them into the back of a car. Yeah. So, and the little boy saw like the, uh, the two boys basically approaching the drug drop scene. Yeah. Um, realizing they were approaching something and turning around like, fuck, let's get out of here. And then they were called back. They were called back. And when they didn't go back, there was a shot fired. But we don't know which shot, wh- who, sh- who shot the shot because the boys they also had, had a gun. gun. Yeah. Um, and there's nothing about, like, gun shot wounds in any of these reports or anything. But still, I don't think anyone was actually shot, but the, yeah. the boy heard a shot. I so. think someone called them back. They were ignoring them, and he shot the gun in the air to be like, I'm fucking serious. Get back yeah. here. And then and I think then they, they walked back over. Back. But and for I think sure, they there's accounts from more than one person that says that the boys were handcuffed and laid on the ground, and that's when they were beaten. Yeah. Um, and oh ultimately gosh. killed. Yeah. Um, so there's a later testimony, and this is what I was struggling to find right before we had to record that I didn't know about. So I was like, oh, God, I need to learn more about this and put it in. Um, Charlene Wilson uh i think she was in the dea um she was there that night i know it's so multi-layered what like was there just a party of all bad police officers that night there were a lot of people there um and at the time she was dating dan Harmon. just saying everything that she saw that night and like giving the she's whole on account. tape saying like this person shot at this kid. So she's this person the truth, beat this kid, supposedly. presumably. Yeah. yeah. She's like, I was there. I saw it. Yep. So, and then Dan Harmon, this is all, again, me piecing so it together, but he doesn't find out about this testimony of hers until like a couple years later. Uh, they're all part of this bad scene together, and he basically puts her in jail for drugs. He puts her in jail for drugs and then just fucking because keeps he her there. Out. He c- because he's a mean ex-boyfriend and she's going to rat on him. Yeah. And she this was in jail for a while. I'm sorry again that I don't remember how Which they how would long. both have access to this drugs. This is the DA. Like place drugs this on her. This is the her prosecuting her, right? attorney of the town. Yep. Like, get oh in jail. They arrest her on a minor drug charge that she even says they weren't her drugs that they were planted on her. Well, that's what it, yeah, like they all can just grab them. Well, I mean, they were doing drugs and she was probably like, she could have been caught with drugs, but like just for shorties, they had some to put in her pocket. Yeah, like he said. made sure it happened. Yeah. And kept her in jail. And I think maybe her son was taken away. Oh, oh I didn't find anything about that. <laughs> yeah. Part, but because th- she was a single mom. So, okay. I don't understand. What makes me crazy about cases like this is that all of these people work together to keep these secrets. Mm-hmm. People are terrible at doing that. Well, like people are terrible at doing good things together. 
how does this happen where so many people are involved and no one slips up? Um, mm, I think people do, and I think they're killed, or I think people well, are paid I off. Guess so. Yeah, money does a lot of the work but, for you. But and still, then if the carrot still. doesn't work, then you do the stick. And like I was what before you got here earlier today, Carlin, you know, was overwhelmed by this story, which is totally reasonable because this is an overwhelming story. She had said that, you know, she she thought it was funny, all of the conspiracies at first. Mm -hmm. And I said that I don't usually subscribe to conspiracy theories. Mm -hmm. I don't think everyone in the town worked against the guy from making a murderer because there are secretaries. There are people that don't well, make it and enough. it's those people that are just jabbing the what ifs like, oh, but what about yeah. this? Like, and this is one of the only <clears throat> cases that I've ever really, really looked into and tried to learn as much as I could about where, no man, like it's big, it's bigger. It goes it's like, so big. It's that's so what much I mean. bigger. Yeah. Like it's it goes huge. all the way to the top in the yeah. most like cliched sense yeah. of the conspiracy theory yeah. thing. Like and it does. Perfect segue. This is where I get into like a little bit of the conspiracy theory stuff. Um, and this one is the one where I was like, LOL, no way. That's, mm -hmm. that's funny. Uh, Bill Clinton was the governor of Arkansas at the time this that's all happened. Right. So his political campaign was running at the time. Oh, yeah. um, and there's a bunch of weird conspiracy surrounding Clinton. First of all, uh, Clinton defends fucking Malik the whole time. This is real. This mm -hmm. isn't a conspiracy. Clinton defends Malik the whole time, despite all the bogus reports he's giving from autopsies. Clinton even increased his salary during the time that he was a medical examiner. He said that some of the discrepancies between his report about the boys on the tracks were because he was overtired, overworked, underpaid. Yeah, he was underpaid, so let's give him a raise. Yeah, so he gave him a raise. I'm um, so depressed. I'm going to leave. So It gets worse. But why would Clinton protect Malik and go against popular Good opinion question. so much? I know. Turns out Malik was also the medical examiner who did autopsies on more than one malpractice suit against Bill Clinton's mother. Um, his mother, Virginia Dwyer Kelly, who was a nurse anesthetist. Nurse anesthetist. 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 Anesthesiologist. No, different. anesthetist. It's different. And I'm not going to tell her stories, but basically, she more or less killed two women. Um, and Malik gave autopsy covered reports. Covered it up. That covered it. Yeah. And said they were accidents or that they were due to something else. But K Clinton and Kelly both are like, no way. Mm -mm. We didn't even know that Malik was affiliated with those reports at all. We just knew that it was accidental and it wasn't, it was no fault. Yeah. So pretty weird coincidence. It's disappointing. If that was our governor that went on to be president and we knew about the boys on the tracks, there are girls that are like, I went to high school with these boys. This was never a whodunit. We knew exactly who did this. And they were 17 years old at the time. But aren't they? So they, so Malik, that's his name, mm -hmm. is not voted in. He's, that's his job. Yeah, he's, yeah, he's not the sheriff. Oh, yeah, he's no, a he's medical, a medical examiner. examiner. So that's, okay, so he doesn't get voted. And then so, when Clinton becomes yeah. governor or president, he gets like a fairly high up position. Yeah, well, he changed, yeah, he went into a different role. I should have written it down. Ew. It's okay. Um, it doesn't matter because it's just gross. But like, what does matter is that Clinton gave him a raise when everyone was like, what the fuck? Come on, Bill. Well, Clinton was like, so I think I can solve this problem. I'm just going to give him like a slightly different title and a lot more money. Yeah. In 1994, there was this propaganda video put out called the Clinton Chronicles, mm. which was like throwing all the shade at Bill Clinton, drawing all the connections between him and various crimes, not just this yeah. one. I was young enough at this time that I don't remember this stuff. And it's it's fucking crazy. I didn't realize there were so many different things. Well, everyone. And it's also like, but this is the day now, like day and age now where like this is the beginning of check your sources mm -hmm. with all of those like videos and that have the yeah. truth or whatever. Everybody that I saw on Reddit was like, careful. It's a slippery slope. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. And like once you're like, once they think they've got you with this one thing, that's true. Yes. They're going to feed you a bunch of other yeah. stuff and totally. you're going to be so outraged by the one thing you're going to eat the other eight. Oh, yeah. yeah. Especially you know? if you're someone who's in the middle or you don't have a... Yeah. It's also important or... to note that the first George Bush was president during this time. 
And he was also aware of what was happening down there in Arkansas. So, like, if you oh, hate... during the time of Boys Elvis. Yeah, so yeah. if, like, you hate the Democrats... Oh, yeah, there's You other, have to hate oh, the Republicans. There's you other know, theories like, that put him in it, too. Exactly. So I, like... It's like, that's cool. You can make a video, but it isn't about a party line. It's just white men with power. Mm. It doesn't matter if they're Democrats or Republicans or Libertarians or Green Party members. It's white guy, old white men with power. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, so in the Clinton Chronicles, Kevin and Don's case is part of it. And they allege that when Clinton was the govern- governor of Arkansas, he was involved with an operation that was moving large amounts of drugs, guns, and money from Central America passing through an Arkansas airport, which I think was called Mina. Does that sound right? Yeah, the Mina. Mm-hmm. Mina Airport. Um, because it's this little, like, bumfuck town, like... No one's going to come look for it. Like, Yeah, but it's pretty um, southern. It's a good way to get drugs. So a lot of shit was coming through there. Um, also, it was Iran-Contra, so it was supported by the government. Yeah. And there's another like really large drug kingpin guy that's related with this. Fucking what's his name? Mm. Fuck. Is he from America? Yes. Were you going to say Pablo Escobar? No. No. I was talking to She's Eliza. She's talking to me. <laughs> oh. Eliza's like, hmm. I've watched Netflix. (laughs) Anyway, this account said the boys had stumbled upon a shipment moving through Saline County. I think that's what happened. Same. Um, Harmon was later convicted of racketeering, conspiracy, extortion, and drug possession with intent to distribute in 1997. Harmon's convicted and sentenced to 11 years in prison. Uh, And this is the nail in the coffin that has the boys' parents realizing that their son's death deaths quote had occurred in an environment of local corruption yeah you think Harmon wasn't the only person convicted i think his girlfriend was convicted as well um and then two of the undercover wilson yeah and then two of the undercover police police officers were convicted i don't have those names i'm sorry no it's fine it's like it just kept going and it kept going for decades yeah but still there's no official like this group was responsible, nothing like that. It's just no, like, it's just like one person falling, another geez. person falling, another person falling. You know, I mean, all of the low hanging fruit, so that you don't really get to the top. Wow, that's crazy. And those boys to be in that wrong place, wrong time. Yeah, like I think that maybe they weren't going out to spotlight hunt. I think maybe they were they. Everyone in the town apparently knew that this was a drop site for drugs. So I think maybe they were um, just going to go, like, look. They were going to look for drugs. See what it, or just, like, or even see, we saw this. We yeah. Saw what they were doing. Like, I think that they were maybe going to look for, like, a bale of marijuana or something. You know, like, it, it, it's like the way you would drive around on a haunted road when you're in high right. school. Or, like, let's tempt fate. Let's see what exactly. happens. Exactly. You're looking for something exciting. You're looking for trouble, mm-hmm. which is fine but when not you're that, 17 not the kind of trouble they you're actually, not looking to be executed and laid on railroad so tracks sad. yeah so i found this email that linda ives which linda ives oh I my know. god she is the one out of all the four parents sorry <laughs> she is the one out of the four parents that just keeps pushing this she's like the one that's like the face of it basically she's She's the the parent does these interviews she puts out these youtube videos she does all this shit just keeps on trucking and i love her she writes this letter in 1999 an email that um i can't read the whole thing because it's super long but it's listing out the reason that she thinks bill clinton's fingerprints are all over her son's murder so some of them are obviously like um, steadfastly defending Malik, um, giving him a 41% salary increase despite public outcry. What else? Um, an FBI agent told us that the state Democratic Party chairman, Lib Carlisle, called the state called the state capitol to call off the state police investigation of the boys' murders. Uh, one of them says, I was placed on Clinton's enemies list and, in fact, singled out by the White House counsel, Mark Fabiani, to reporter Phil Weiss, who wrote the New York Times Magazine article, Clinton Haters. The mainstream conspiracy commerce report was a why was I important enough to be to even be on the list, much less be singled out to reporters. Um, It's just like all these little things that she's, you know, it's all pointing at Clinton. I do want to say something about Campbell. Mm -hmm. So um, there were two undercover police officers, the two men that were witnessed beating the boys up. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, one of them's name was uh, Campbell. The other's name is Lane. I don't know their first names right now. Campbell eventually became a sheriff in Arkansas. And then um, he and his wife Kelly were indicted. They were char charged with burglary, theft, as well as with taking inmates from the city jail for sex and, and providing them with drugs and alcohol. What did you not come across this? So this is someone who was seen at the scene that night. So there were two undercover cops who were working that time trying to like bust the drug trade that oh was happening. My God. But they were actually in on the drug trade that was happening. Yeah. And there are three different witnesses who saw two people, two undercover cops beating these two teenage boys up at a gas station, throwing them in the back of the car. And the next day, the boys are dead. Nobody says anything. Everyone's terrified, obviously, because six people ended up dead who were going to talk. But in 2006, Campbell and his wife went to jail. Apparently, oh, they... Oh, not till 2006? No. But, I mean, to go to jail because you're making inmates have sex with you is like... It's That's the fireworks of going to jail. Really? Oh, I know. I just thought it was earlier next than that. Level. It's next level scumbaggery. Like, like, gross. Yeah. You are gross. So I just oh, want to yeah. read. Agree. I, if I can't. I mean, so I'm going to read you what prisoner Andrew Baker disclosed. Chief Jay Campbell's wife had a very close relationship with at least two of the 309s, which were the inmates mm -hmm. that were moved from Texas to Arkansas. Baker disclosed that the chief's wife, Callie Campbell, had brought a fifth of vodka, a fifth of gin, and a fifth of Crown Royal and other bottles of unknown alcoholic substances to the jail. Baker also reported that Kelly Campbell had bought marijuana for jail prisoners, given one prisoner a cell phone, which they, quote, used to communicate with each other regularly, allowed photos of herself to be taken, quote, in various intimate poses inside the old Atosco building, which was part of the jail, when the, while the inmates were working on her husband's party barge or the mayor's party barge. I don't remember whose party okay. barge, but the mayor's Someone, involved in this as well. Party barge. Somebody's, somebody has a party barge. Had sex with inmates, quote, 18 to 20 times in various places in and around Lone Oak, including Gosh, Holiday Inn Express. The drive on this woman. I know. The press box at the ballpark. Unmentioned the team because... Uh, the Campbell's home on Cherry Street, which sounds picturesque, and the chief's office at the Lono P Police Department oh my God. paid one inmate $260 to, quote, keep his mouth shut. Damn. Yep. Officers at the police department <sighs> reported, quote, confirmed that the chief's wife was having a relationship with the 309s, plural, and coming and going freely from the jail. Like, oh, this woman honey. is like, listen, my husband's the chief of police. I must get in here. I'm going to have sex with these inmates, and there is absolutely nothing that you can do about it. Uh, just like to, so just to go along with your cult of what the fuck, but also you get to do whatever you want in these towns, these small towns no one's watching you. That oh, is like the women who want to be wives with an inmate times 10. 000. That's Diane Broadback, yeah. like times a yeah. billion. Oh, yeah. Come on. This, oh, also, they w eventually they were arrested for methamphetamine possession. Yeah. I Speaking of meth, I forgot to say that uh, Charlene was uh, on meth the night that yeah. this stuff happened. And that's why everybody was high. That's why a lot of them yeah. didn't come forward for a really yep. long time. Um, okay. So the boys' parents just keep on fighting literally for, I realize, the length of Eliza's life. They've been fighting. Wow. Um, the Ives' lawyer, David Lewis, said documents he's received from the FOIA, Freedom of Information Act, requests in the past pertaining to the deaths of Kevin Ives and Don Henry have been so heavily redacted that he claims they're practically useless. August of 2016, Linda Ives and Lewis file a lawsuit for a violation of the Freedom of Information Act by local and federal officials or stonewalling in relation to the boys' deaths, which is obviously completely accurate. Yeah. Uh, while two judges recused themselves of the case it was finally heard by judge brian miller who ended up dismissing most of the defendants from the lawsuit except for three but let me tell you who, who? she had in the original lawsuit the usa yes yeah girl the central intelligence agency go big sister defense intelligence agency mm -hmm. and these are all ones that were dropped so far mm -hmm. uh department of justice is still open yeah um, i like that Oh, wait, I'm sorry. Wrong. 
Department of Justice is not open. That one was also terminated. The USA. Yes. The CIA. Yes. The Defense Intelligence Agency. That's great. Department of Justice. Okay. Department of Homeland Security. The DEA. The FBI. The U.S. Attorney's Office. Wow. The U.S. Department of State. The state of Arkansas. Yes, girl. Yes. The Arkansas State Police, the Bryant Police Department, and the Saline County Sheriff's Office. You know what? On point. So the ones that uh, most of them were dropped, but uh, the ones that are still open are um, the Executive Office of the U.S. Attorneys, the uh, the DEA, and the Department of Homeland Security. This woman... So they were asked to turn over for private review documents that had been formally redacted. The judge is also asking the DEA to provide more reports from that time, allowing them to do their own redactions, which he will look over. And if he does not approve, the court will then give it back to them to do their own redactions and submit back to the DEA uh, to agree with or not. So that's where that's sitting as of today. So she is alive. Are all the parents alive? I am not sure. I should have looked, but Linda is still the one. Like I said, I found She's multiple. She's the like, figurehead of the lawsuit. Yeah. I don't. I don't think that all of the parents. Just are still Google alive. her. She's all over YouTube. Like she's. She is. She's kind of like. Paula Dean esque in her looks, <laughs> like she's got this big white hair, she's and just she's just south. Like, is darn. she? Is she the? Mom she's the mother that of was Kevin. On Kevin. Unsolved mysteries. Yes, she's on it. She's on. She's it. the blonde. Oh yeah, we're both we're both. I know both dads were, but I don't remember if both. There was a were. woman. She was blonde. Okay. I think it shows the mother, them all, but Kevin they don't all talk. Eyes. Yeah, that's so. the mother of Kevin. I remember Eyes. one of the moms talking. I don't know if the other boy or young man ha- like if his mother was involved because they only speak to the father, and the father is the only person in the reenactment, and he's mm-hmm. the only person in the room while they're about to give the press conference. Hmm. So I don't, I don't I know that. what his uh, <gasps> familial situation. I was. am so sad. So. Honey, this has been going on. I know. Isn't this insane? Sometimes I don't seek this stuff out because it will make me too sad. There's you know, another, of course. There's another really weird addition to this story that is very recent, which um, wasn't talked about in any of the other podcasts because it, they happened before this. Um, so this past February, former WWF wrestler Billy Jack Haynes came forward with a wit- witness account of the murders. What? Yes. And he's like, oh, we will definitely post pictures of him in like in his wrestler heyday. Um, But now he's like an old guy with a mullet. The fuck? Um, Yeah. Haynes is open about his past history with addiction. Um, He says, you know, he's been holding this secret for 30 years, 27 of which he was not sober. So he's recently sobered up. He's recently a Christian and he is coming forward with this information because he's riddled with guilt. He admits he was involved with transporting and trafficking cocaine throughout the U.S. in the 80s. He mentions that an Arkansas criminal politician, Uh which is what we call him throughout this whole thing because nobody will post the name. He's saying it in interviews. Oh, and they're redacted. But nobody will post it. So um, all the way to the top. You were not wrong. He so he says that the politician was suspicious that money from the drops from drug drops had been going missing. He also says that local law enforcement were were involved in the operation. I think it's pretty obvious that he's talking about Bill Clinton, I but just, he could also be talking about oh. another. He was talking about the DA, the mayor. Yeah, the, there's the mayor a lot. was involved. Everybody was involved. So um, I, yeah, I if have they're redacting the name. I would have to think it's Bill Clinton because nobody gives a shit about the mayor or the DA right. at that point. And I want to believe this guy. You you can keep going, but I want to believe this guy, but I also have uh, a lot of, I just don't believe any Clinton conspiracy theories. Like when she there was are a lot a out body there. Yeah. double yeah. and all this uh, crap. I know. Oh, yeah. So I immediately am like, oh, this guy just Yeah, is he like, is he, he interviewing on yeah. AM radio 920 or is he yeah. on CNN? Yeah, so he says he witnessed the boys' murders um, by the hands of other people who were there. He says their bodies were put on the tracks to be mutilated. Um, there's a video, actually there's multiple videos of him on the internet um, telling people what he saw 30 years ago and encouraging them to donate money to the investigations GoFundMe. Because Linda Ives... Uh, Allison's writing this down for. <laughs> Hold on, I have a lot about him. Billy Jack Haynes, um, <laughs> Linda Ives has a GoFundMe. 
to get money f- to continue her investigations because she's a boss ass bitch and she's just she's doing this on her my own. Queen. Yep. So anyway, Haynes in the video is j- basically the whole thing is him being like, please donate money to the GoFundMe. Like, please help them. So it's well, coming from a good place and it doesn't There's nothing seem in it for him. He hasn't yeah. like, exactly. He doesn't like donate money and now I'm going to get a wrestling career back or now I'm going to be famous. He's just like, I feel like shit. Can yeah. you donate money? Because I helped in the perpetuation of Yeah, it? and like Linda even does a video with him, like sitting next to him. So Linda believes him. Uh, Haynes does not have a great track record for sharing information on the internet because he's made some crazy claims over the years that... There you go. You lost ...aren't me. awesome. I wanted to see if you want to be on the show. But... Um, <laughs> Uh, but I wrote that down too, that Haynes really has nothing to gain from making this claim. Um, he is also recorded as, um, talking about being involved with drug trafficking in interviews as early as the early two thousands. So it's not like that part's new. He didn't just make that up. What else does he say on the internet though? Is he like a Sandy Hook? No, he made some claims about like other people in the WWE. F, like oh, just saying weird I'm things. I'm fine with that. Yeah. yeah. No, it's nothing. It's like political. When or someone beats you within an inch uh-huh. of your life, like once a week. Yeah. It's gonna but get he's just, fucking he's weird. He said some wild shit, and he was an addict for 27 years. So people are like, eh. Haynes's story got a little crazier as the days went on. The interviews I found with him were from kark.com, which is the ABC channel in Arkansas. Um, the news channel in the second article that came out Haynes says that there might be a video of what happened that night I've heard that too but I guess maybe the source was Haynes so if anything seems crazy it's that because why on earth would Would somebody these criminals make an evidence video like that's pretty crazy to me but um Unless you're picking up for like a drug kingpin and you want to prove that you have to prove it. You're not stealing the money and this is how the money fell. This is where it landed. We've been here the whole time. Now we're picking it up. Now we're bringing it to the car. Like it was just a video set up. Yeah. Yeah. So he like casually mentions this in a in a interview with this guy, Doc Washburn of um, the Arkansas News Channel. Um, And he's when he's asked if he can prove he was there that night and he said mentions there's an eight second video and Washburn is like, wait, what? So he asks him if he has the tape and yeah, he's it's just a vine. Seconds? It's a vine we made. I know. <laughs> no one made eight. I was like, okay, I could understand tracking an eight second video. So weird. And he goes, well, that's something that my private investor investigator and I haven't decided to say where, or why or anything. That's up to the private investigator. It's but up to you, bro. You just had it. He goes, but that would be a big piece of the puzzle if it were true. So that's a very weird thing to say. Okay. Haynes goes on to say that because the criminal politician who hired him thought that money was being stolen from the drops, he hired Haynes for security. I don't believe him. He was supposed to record the drop, like video record the drop, record the thieves the politician suspected attempting to steal the money and eventually kill them. Oh. And that is why he went there. He and he admits it that he went there with the intent so, to do this job. So the universe, the chaos of the universe came together the night that he was supposed to record the thieves. These two young men were out shooting possums with a fucking flashlight and a gun. And they just happened to happen upon the professional wrestler who was working for Bill Clinton who had to record. I mean, it's just a lot. It's a lot. It really okay. is. If we thought that Pat Conway was lying, we have to think that this guy's lying. Come on. I don't know. This whole time he's dropping names of people who were involved and who were there that he saw. Um, and the, a Daily Mail article came out just last month, August 18th. Um, and it says that several of the law enforcement officials named in Haynes' confession went on to be arrested and convicted on unrelated drug charges Can't or were like. themselves murdered. So many of the people he's naming were actually really there, part of this drug ring, which, sure, maybe he could have found that out, and that's why he knows that. I mean, if he just came out recently, the stuff that I found out about Campbell came out in yeah, no, totally. 2006, that information's been out there, but still, he's like retelling this whole story and saying all these names. In the interview with Washburn, he's also trying to make sense of why and how a WWF wrestler was in rural Arkansas at a drug drop on August 23rd, 1987, yeah. because he was he knows he was wrestling in Detroit on August 21st. No, uh, so, this guy though. No, and no, here's no. Haynes' story: is that he received an envelope at the show with a phone number of the 
criminal politician he mentions, which sounds totally bonkers crazy. Um, but he also says he's been dealing coke since 1977 and had made connections over the years, which is kind of reasonable. Like people in the drug rings know each other. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Google Hangouts. I don't know. <laughs> they don't know each other that well. So again, Haynes says he was hired to investigate and enforce the drug drug drop. But he only managed to capture eight seconds of the video recording on a fucking VHS camcorder mm-hmm. because and it's he calls that it out old. as that when he in one of the interviews. And then he's like, "Well, we haven't decided if we're going to talk about that yet. And you just talked about it." And still, yeah, he's apparently still in possession of this video. It yes, has and not how been can how that's what like, I don't know. Think about eight seconds. That's about eight seconds. What do yeah. you see in that? The, maybe well, someone's the whooshing a camera. So, okay. You see, like, the face of someone who might have, like, oh, I only ended up with eight seconds. Like, what is eight seconds going to give us on yeah. an old shitty VHS recording? It isn't like a digital recording where we can break things down by nanoseconds. Right. It's right. a tape. Yeah. yeah. So he says. Also, on, I don't trust born again night, Christians. <laughs> he says on that night, um, everything went completely. Completely as expected. Nothing out of the ordinary happened. The drop went off without a hitch. Um, But the group saw these two boys over by the train tracks. He says at that point, two of the men went to go get the boys and returned 20 minutes later with the boys' bodies bleeding profusely from being beaten. He thought they were either dead or nearly dead when so he saw them. But that directly goes against like five witnesses that saw the boys at a gas station. One was beaten at the gas station. The other was just thrown into the car. Yeah, that part's a little... And different witness accounts don't all agree with that yeah. either. So. Uh, yeah. So who knows what's really I, true. What is happening? Yes. Who are these I know. But yeah, so he... I'll speed it up, but he says like he wasn't part of the killing, but he was part of placing them on the tracks. He was instructed to by the politician who said, don't leave Stop any witnesses saying politician. behind. politician. He says, uh, don't leave any witnesses right. behind. You're right. Eliza's right with the I Clinton. think it's a Clinton hater, and I yeah, don't Yeah, like Clinton conspiracy thing. Um, uh, he also says he was wearing a black wrestling mask the whole time to hide his face because he was <laughs> okay. instructed to by the politician. No. <laughs> I know. But, but his, I just his had an amazing actually idea. actually really sad, and he's like, I didn't want to do that, but if I didn't do that at that time, I'm going to get shot and killed. That's what I'm thinking in my mind. I didn't come here to kill no kids. I would have fulfilled my contract with the politician with the two state troopers. That's what I came down to do, and I would have done that. I'm not afraid to admit that. He wants to make peace with them, and he knows he's putting his life at risk, but he's putting things in God's hands because he wants to, like, be honest and, like, I know, I know. We can't, yeah, we cannot say too much because he's still... Yes. around and he's a but wrestler he will kick our asses no no but he he's won't because he's a god yeah. a god-fearing man oh he's an old man yeah oh okay he's old so now. i could take him all right he's, he's a not fearing old big man. Like, bring it the size difference between his like wrestler photos and now are crazy he's yeah, like we will shrunken. Post it. i can't wait to see i can't either yeah. oh yeah that mullet's good um but that's it that was the most recent thing that came out in february and now we're just waiting on the lawsuit i mean you surprised sell. allison so that's huge I didn't know anything about this wrestler. KB, you did awesome. Yeah, Carlin, that was Thank amazing. You. I'm sorry, and I was a little disjointed. No, no, I didn't think it was at all. You blew my mind. Yeah, and you nailed this. And if people want to know more, there are a million podcasts that do a really great coverage of this. Yes, and the book. You should read the book. Yeah, and if you guys want to know more about the witnesses that were murdered, not murdered, accidentally died before they had to testify we will do happily i will happily do a mini and then i'll sit here with my mouth open yeah like so if you want to learn more about that just tell us and we'll we'll deep dive into that shit because those are the people the stories are probably just as interesting oh yeah yeah it's huge you know like i with the db cooper thing i was like they found a skeleton of a girl that was raped and murdered i yeah separately four hours can you tell me about that hours trying to find that girl because i was like should we have a sideshow of all the dead bodies we find? Like, uh, cold because, skeleton. Because it's yeah. not, yeah, because it isn't not interesting just because it's not part of the main narrative. That's right, yeah. yeah. It's, it's a part of a narrative. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, let us know and we'll look into it. I'm so mad. Nice work, Katie. No, we're just really mad. You nailed it, girl. Thanks. Do you have this in over an hour? Are you sure? Mm-hmm.
<laughs> do you need two? I'll do my best. I got a battery pack over here. Mm, yeah, I'll tell you if you need a refill. Sports ball. Sports balls. <laughs> this, this segment was called sports balls. <laughs> All right, so I am just <laughs> embarrassed <laughs> to even talk about any of this after. <laughs> oh my gosh! Stories. Don't. <laughs> They're so good. All right, so here is the story of um, some missing sports shit and a man named Dennis Walker. And I know everyone is going to care equally about this story as the previous two. <laughs> no skipping, everyone. <laughs> you better not skip over my story. This is you not my fault. Fucking listen. <laughs> hey, luck of the draw. It's not your fault. <laughs> sports ball. All right. Um, once upon a time, there was a man who cared way too much about I Sports like how you things. led with that. You're like, this is going to hook them. <laughs> I'm going to keep this short because no one cares. Um, we care. Okay. We care. <clears throat> I mean, a man did die, so we feel bad. Yeah. But, but in general, we don't care. So Dennis Walker, um, this is a story about him and his collection worth nearly $10 million, um, including Babe Ruth's ring and uniform, Mickey Mantle's uniform, Pete Rose's silver bat and many more items that all went missing. I have a question. Uh, okay, <gasps> oh, already. Wow. Can't Listeners. Answer. I don't know how old you are. Do you have any idea what we're talking about? <laughs> I know. Do things. you know who I Babe Ruth is? I knew Babe Ruth, but I was like, Pete Rose? Pete Rose is younger, honey. No, I know. Oh. But Babe Ruth is in the history books. Pete Rose right. isn't because he got booted out for gambling. Wait, he did? I didn't know that. He can't be allowed in the Baseball Hall of Fame because he gambled. I thought that name sounded familiar. No wonder Story. he went to the fake Hall of Fame that Dennis Walker made. Okay, let's start from the beginning. Let's so start. in June of 1980, Dennis Walker opens an investment company in Medford, Oregon. What? Uh, is that close to us? I really don't know. Five hours away. Yeah, it's close enough. He also opened his own bank in Tonga. Tonga? Yeah. Where's that? The Isle of Tonga. South Pacific Island. Oh, he opened his own bank in the South Pacific? Yeah, it's fine. It's great. That's legit. Uh -huh, it's totally legit. So more than 140 people gave him $7 million to invest. Um, in the show, Peggy Stewart is shown. She has the longest hair I've ever seen. It's beautiful. Do you remember that? No. Oh, she Carlin's like, down. I have the longest hair that's oh, beautiful. Wait, is that the glasses lady? Mm -hmm. oh, I, didn't, I guess I didn't you realize how long You only see her hair when she hands him something. She says, Mr. Walker, I have something for you to sign. Oh. And then she sits down. Oh, you should I look didn't it up. It's notice. so long. But it's really I did her. like her whole vibe, though. Oh, me too. Yeah. She had great skin. She is his employee. Um, she does a reenactment talking to him. But then she also is interviewed. She says... All the employees trusted him implicitly. They all implicitly they all had um, money with him. Um, they were all investors. He used a lot of his money that people gave him to invest to buy paper and cloth, sports memorabilia. <laughs> uh, I I can't relate. Um, so he buys baseball cards, blah, de, blah, de, blah. <laughs> <laughs> you have to at least pretend to care about But that. I mean, some like really valuable. Yeah. So he has in that world stuff. Um, Pete, Pete, Pete Rose's Rose. ring after he hit 4,000 hits, um, which is diamond encrusted and worth lots of money. He has Babe Ruth's, uh, world series ring, Mickey Mantle's uniform. As I said, Babe Ruth's number three, New York Yankees uniform, he has a lot of like very rare stuff. He had some some sheet of baseball cards, I think, from 1933 that yeah. had never been cut, which was yeah. even interesting to me. Yeah, which is cool. Deal. It's just like a cool little piece of time. Yeah. Um, but if we were investing with a good guy and he started buying sports memorabilia, wouldn't you say maybe don't? Well, that is what is weird that. about Peggy Stewart, because she says on the episode, it actually made me feel better because it made me feel like he wouldn't do this. In 1986, Medford Police, so this is six years after he started his investment slash probably Ponzi scheme investment company, Medford Police obtained a warrant to search his office. 
This is after Dennis Walker decides he's going to open his own Hall of Fame for sports memorabilia in Medford, Oregon, in an old bank building. In a strip mall, In a strip mall. That's what it looked like from the shop. So weird. Medford, even now, is not a place you, like, go. It's not a destination. Wait, it's not an arts and culture you destination? He's making it one. He is. So it's up and coming. So he's got his Hall of Fame. Um, Pete Rose helps open it. He had he had bought some things from Pete Rose, which I think is frowned upon. Pete Rose had a lot of debts to pay. Yeah, a lot of legal and you bills. shouldn't be selling your own no nope. your own stuff. That's yeah. what I was wondering. Like, how did he get all? They of call it? that a sports red flag. No, I don't know if they do, but that's what it is. That's what we call it. <laughs> okay, so... Throw it on the field. <laughs> red card home run. could have been maybe a sports No, record. not a home run. No, don't they throw card. flags on the field for soccer and football? Soccer, red yeah. Red card and... Yellow oh, card. Oh, fuck. Oh, okay. you would it's know. It's okay. You played soccer. Sports ball, I'm doing yay. my best. We're all doing it. Sports ball. Okay. Um... So after they searched his office, they were able to gather enough information to prosecute him for fraud and racketeering. It's so confusing. Like, what is the illegal sale of unregistered yeah. securities? What does that know. even mean? I don't know. I oh yeah. I, I was like financial. I, I doubt that most of us would know what that means. What does that mean? So the Medford police officer. Do you remember him? talking he says that dennis walker would say you give me ten thousand dollars and i'll give you twelve thousand five hundred but all he would do is give which sounds IOU. really good but then he would just give them a piece of paper that said i owe you twelve thousand five hundred in one year but that's yeah. essentially what our 410ks do it's what our one case yeah i don't know if so it's like i don't understand I don't know. I wish they would have explained it a little bit. I just didn't care enough. No, yeah. no, no, That's no. I don't mean to call you out. I really am genuinely like, yeah. no, nobody that, listening is to also like going to know what that means Dealing in either. more money than he actually had. Okay. So he basically just took money from one person and then wrote IOUs to like 40 yeah. people. But he, I mean, he had a ton of money. And the other weird thing is that once they started to build a case against him, after realizing they have enough uh, stuff from his office to start prosecuting. No one was compliant with their investigation. All the invest yeah. they thought the investors it. were saying, "No, we like him. We're we are getting our money." Yeah, and one so of the guys was like, confusing. "I don't want the government getting their cotton picking hands." Uh -huh. Oh yeah, the cotton picking I comment. Was like, okay, it's very let's Southern unpack Oregon, this. That right. is not cool. And a. You, they wouldn't put that in an interview today. No, <laughs> no, they wouldn't. Yeah, that's problematic. So Eliza's like, it is, but. Also, I didn't care. Yeah, get me through this story. <laughs> okay, so everyone said they were making their money back and everything was fine. Um, he was worried, Dennis Walker was worried once he realized this investigation was um, going to become more serious. He didn't want his collection to be taken by the state, so he packed up the whole museum and all of his things and he left Oregon. So, and then that is the employee that Allison's referencing um, in the show. He's, he is the one, I forget his name, but he's the one who's asked to pack up the whole. It's like Tex McQueen. Hall of Fame. <laughs> don't know why I don't have my notes in front of me. And um, Eliza's surprised that you and I both cared more I about this. fact check KB without my facts. Come on, you have a reputation to uphold, Garland. Uh, he is the one who is like. He packs it all up and he's like, yeah, I was in agreement. I wanted this to turn to liquid so the state couldn't liquid assets, which I guess he means sell it all he thought to that, give the money back to yeah, the investors, which that thought. makes sense. But his main reason was so the state could not take it, which is very anti-government. and Which is very... new. Oregonian? Southern Oregon? I'm not going to say Oregonian because that's not the Oregonian that I identify with. I but know, but Southern Oregon is I bet different. if you live in Austin, you don't identify with, like, True. the regions of Texas. But you still have to acknowledge that they exist. Yeah, I think it is just weird when you grow up not in that part. Like, yeah. in a bubble, like KB's saying, I don't even think of it like that. Like, anyway, cut Wait, that. Carlin's still looking up. Okay. Um, no, I have the employee's name. Yes! It's Sandy Sanders. Sandy Sanders! Another lazy name. A direct relation to Dave Davis. Just kidding. That's not also, true. Also, men but named Sandy. 
It's a man? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, right. He was the, cook. He was the one saying they're cotton picking him. Okay, so he packs up all his things. He leaves Oregon. And 16 months later, a man registered <gasps> right. under the name Charles Lee was found deceased in a Las Vegas hotel room. Is this your second suicide story? Well, we'll find out. No, we won't find out. We don't know. Oh, um, I just assumed if you're this, dead in a hotel from pills. Well, so this, just we don't, don't know. know. So this man, he turned out to be Dennis Walker. There was a prescription pill bottle on the counter with the, the name Dennis Walker. But, I mean, he could have had, it didn't say the pill bottle was empty. Um, it Still to this day, there's no clear cause of death. Um, no one could can say whether it was accidental, a homicide, or a suicide. A lot of people think it was a mob or some sort of gang hit. What? That is so um, lazy. So also his collection worth $10 million in That's those true. years was nowhere to be found. Okay. So af this is my update. It's two paragraphs long. Get ready. After this episode aired... A collector named Malcolm Jackson turned the uniform into police. What? So the, um, that was easy. The Babe Ruth uniform. He watched the episode. He turned it in. Um, he was like, huh, whose uniform is that hovering over my head? So weird. Uh, the police said he was very vague about where he got it, and he didn't want to be involved, obviously. Um a couple of years later, he eventually got a court order to have the uniform returned to him because nothing ever came of the rest of the investigation. So oh. they couldn't really hold it any longer, I guess. So he was like, that's it. You had your time. Yeah, it's yeah, very that's mine. Also, that's a lot of money. Yeah. I'm yeah. fine with that. Yeah. Right? Okay. So then the uniform, if it is the same uniform changed hands a few times and in 1995 was stolen out of Mark Lastman's car in Manhattan. He was going up to a conference where people bring sports stuff. Ugh, I just don't care at all. It's really hard. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> I just can't imagine having the luxury of caring about sports this much. Okay. Right. And spending this much money. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I yeah. can't even fake it. No, spending okay. that much money on this stuff. So your, your disdain is equally <laughs> interesting. <laughs> okay. um, so he, there's, I'll link to it. There's a New York Times article about how heartbroken he is that his uniform is stolen. Um, but the stolen uniform <laughs> is stolen? His uniform is stolen. But Did it was I say a stolen that? uniform. Sorry. Um, yeah, it was. Wait, and what? it was stolen. Oh, got it. Right? It's possibly stolen. Yes. Oh, yes. 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 He's Sorry. like, I can't believe that I had the right. stolen uniform. And then, oh, right. the irony. Yeah. The Shakespearean so, tragedy. Double steals. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Double steals. Got it. Find these keepies. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we always say. <laughs> That's what you say in sports. Find these right? keepies. <laughs> Ooh, this episode's called Find These Keepies. Yes, it is. Okay. But it was thought that the uniform that was stolen could possibly be a fake made by a uniform or a, i'm sorry a costume company yes, i can't even make just eye contact eliza is so repeatedly <laughs> rolling her eyes to the point where i'm not sure if her eyes are gonna come back eliza can't they're gone even, they're I, gone eliza can't even say a uniform company she, right now she literally, is her so head is bored tilted and dead back. inside okay i'm gonna make this quick she's gonna do uh, it do it for all of okay. us they weren't sure if it was maybe a costume <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Okay, I'm so sorry. All, All right. right. Don't so be disrespectful. Here's the deal. Baseball's great. Uh, don't be disrespectful. <laughs> Please uh, right. show I'm some so respect <laughs> to baseball. And thievery. <sighs> okay. Um, I'm just going <laughs> to... Get to know in the future we can't assign Eliza to a thing she doesn't care about. Dude, short straw, though. I know. I'm sorry, honey. It's fine. I think the next episode I have something stupid... That's okay. what happens. Oh, don't worry. I would have not done... You did awesome on those two stories. I would have not done them justice. Be glad I have this shit. I mean, bag. currently, I am. Because, like, <laughs> if there's any part of a story that doesn't agree with you, you clearly come at it okay. from a level of disdain. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Hates sorry. it. No, I'm, I'm trying. Fine. Okay. <laughs> I'm not trying at all. No, I That's know. That's the problem. All right. One more paragraph. Here we go. We guys. can make it. Um... <laughs> 
<laughs> I could have spent my life tracking down, <laughs> tracking down every item that was stolen. Yeah. I, which is what that's, I. That's not what not my therapist would recommend I do. That's not a good so use of your time. That's if true. you want, if you are interested, that is awesome, and I'm so glad I brought this story to you. Also, if you're interested, you know about this already. If you are interested in sports stuff in any way, I guess there's a bunch of Babe Ruth things, <laughs> like. <laughs> myths and oh yeah yeah like there's about, yeah there's just lore about many yes. things that come from him so you probably already know about it one of the <laughs> i thought you meant like belongings <laughs> like no. yeah he's no, got a no. shoe he's got i know pants. that's what I, I was like and we're oh, gonna provide I... the urls for all of those things i guess <laughs> this one's like i have so much work to do okay uh, no that's not what i'm saying tired Okay, so, tired. so exhausting. <laughs> so if this story interests you at all, um, I suggest... Go listen to something else, obviously. <laughs> Just pause now. Um, hallsofshame.com. The halls is H-A-U-L-S of shame. This person who runs this website is a is an investiga- investigative... Investigative? Investigative. Investigative. <laughs> reporter who looks into i'm not kidding only baseball things i was just gonna say do you think there's a podcast about this probably sports crimes probably (laughs) okay so but anyway so much but you can't fake it hallsofshame.com he he really does i'm assuming he could be a she does it really again i don't care (laughs) does a great job i love how you would have done just look up whoever's in charge no, I couldn't. No, it's she fine. Couldn't. It's fine. It's fine. I couldn't muster one. Yeah, as couldn't we muster say. a bug. <laughs> okay, so you're the jewel, <laughs> Kaylin. <laughs> you're like, eh, life is just better now. That's why her eyes are disappearing. Yeah, you're getting look beadier at, look and beadier. Into my jewels. So the writer of the article um, I read from this website in 2012 reported this is the most interesting thing of all time. Of this story, uh, <laughs> reported that Charlie Sheen, the yes. one and only. So the one and only, he <laughs> he is only. starting to say that he's got Babe Ruth's ring and it's his most prized possession. So, um, it's thought that Barry Halper, who is now a deceased um, sports memorabilia collector, it got Charlie Sheen the ring. Babe Ruth's family is doesn't like Barry Helper, so they are like, if Charlie Sheen got it from Barry Helper, then Barry Helper might have been involved in the thievery with Dennis Walker, things like that. Yada yada yada. yada. More if you care, cut any and all of that if you want to. No, it's fine. We Sports. don't listen. Ugh. You can't expect us to care <gasps> about all stories equally. We just went through two really heavy yeah. hitter stories carlin's which left us all very disenchanted <laughs> and now we are so sad that somebody lost their sports clothing <laughs> and their sports jewelry yeah. and we hope that charlie sheen does the right thing and s- returns it to the former owner okay don't hold yes. your breath honey <laughs> no for charlie sheen to be doing the right thing no, charlie sheen's an animal <laughs> obviously not I mean, no. Oh, but that's sort of where we're going to leave this because... Oh, thanks for picking it up for me, ladies. Because it is impressive when Eliza just hates something so hard that... And, like, negative enthusiasm. Yes, but <laughs> she... Not often. She negative wills it into, million. like, what is the opposite of existence? She, you just willed that to not exist anymore, ever. Like, no one's ever going to know about that story. Can't wait. Ew. Oh, okay. You did it. You did it. You did the worst segment anyone's been assigned so far um i did something this week yay are we moving into this let's move into it let's do it this week i began a puzzle yeah and i just had a puzzle on my dining room table and i've just been working on it each evening it's the best and it is so satisfying and delightful i've yet to finish and i can't wait to Put on those puzzle Ooh, pants. That last piece. <laughs> puzzle pants. That's what you do, right? Yeah, I wear my puzzle pants and I do my puzzle. Yeah. Um, I think Allison's not interested, but KB and I and maybe 
Allison's husband will start a puzzle trade trading thing. Ooh, good idea. Because the problem like a with puzzle a puzzle of the month club. Yes. yes. Well, but just <gasps> between us, because million dollar idea. <laughs> Nerds love puzzles. Oh, it's already a thing, honey, and it's so expensive. Um, why is no. it expensive? It's just a picture smashed. I. <laughs> I can do that for that like is the most 99 cents. description of it I have ever heard. I can do that for 99 Accurate. cents, you guys. I can undercut the competition. Okay, let's do that. Splitties? But just between us, like, I don't want to do this same puzzle again. You only no. really want to do a puzzle once. And you also so don't want to buy some puzzles buy them all the time. And then we trade them. Otherwise, like this that. puzzle's just going to sit on my shelf. Mm -hmm. And it's great. It's of books and a cat is on it. <laughs> it's the the most it's ideal for you all right all the things Next. you love you don't know what you're missing out on kb what are you what you've been doing besides researching Honestly, boys on the just track. researching boys on the tracks for um, the last that's not true multiple hours the last multiple hours what were you doing in the previous hours working you started the nexium podcast yeah <gasps> i did start the nexium podcast and oh. it is really good uncover nexium no. Escaping Nexium. Uncover Escaping Nexium. CBC, just like that. That Eliza mentioned Cleo. in our last episode, I believe. Oh my God. I'm so mad that I had to stop listening to it so that I could do my homework for this podcast because it's amazing. Sorry to break your heart. Yeah. But then I also really enjoyed researching the boys on the tracks. Allison. I'm super proud of us. And I'm zero yeah. percent proud of me. I'm only proud of Allison. <laughs> no, I mean, She's done obviously, all the work. yes. And that's what I was going to say. I wasn't going to talk about Nexium. I was going to talk about just thank you, Allison, for like putting together all of this. Isn't it fun? Now it feels it happen, fun. It feels and real. And making it be a real thing. Yeah, yeah. we're having fun because we don't have to edit it. I'm having fun because I use being busy as a defense mechanism. Mm -hmm. So it's working out well for all of us. <laughs> right. Um, no, it's great. Like, it's great. It, it feels awesome. And I know this is by the time everyone's listening to this, it'll be the end of October and we'll already have whatever, whatever. But yeah, yeah. the time we're recording this, only three episodes are like live really happening. Yeah. So it's very exciting for us. It's yeah. It's scary, but it's great. And I'm super proud of us and I'm glad that we committed to it. Me too. And it's fun. Oh, we also saw a play. We did. Oh, we saw Waitress. Yes. We did. We right. Went, we saw a waitress. We did. We saw a waitress. And I think yeah. we all kind of came out at the same place with it. Yeah. It was interesting because it's fairly new, but it seems dated with the Me Too movement and everything happening. That's very heartbreaking right yeah. now um, and in our own lives. So, but it was overall an enjoyable musical. I think two of my favorite musical characters ever are in it. Yes. <laughs> Which is weird to then have a musical that I didn't love overall. Overall. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. All right. Do we have um, anything else to say? Do the outro. Just uh, thank you so much for listening. Uh, email us if you have it. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks for all the no, downloads. For real, you guys are downloading it. We don't know if you're, we don't know who you are. But are you thanks. bots? We don't care. It just feels good. Put yeah. us in your ear holes. Yeah. It's so nice of you guys. We're not Joe Rogan. We're just. Three people in a basement talking about an old TV show. Yep. The fact that anybody listened to us is amazing. It's true. Uh, email us if you want to. You can contact us at resolvedmysteriespodcast.com. We have a P.O. Box. We do. 14005 Portland, Oregon 97293. At that box, we accept gifts, money, secrets, answers to mysteries. Mostly secrets. And anything that isn't glitter or shit. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Here we go. We're almost there, we guys. Are falling apart. <laughs> Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. If you like us, please, please leave a five star review and tell a friend. Uh, for every review this month, we will be donating a dollar to the ACLU. If you have any suggestions on where else you would like us to donate, maybe next month or in the months to follow, leave that in reviews and let us know what you think about the podcast. Follow us on Instagram at re underscore solved mysteries, Twitter on at resolve the pod and Facebook at resolve the pod. Thank you so much for listening. Thanks, Bye, everybody. Bye. See you in two weeks. Bye.